Okay, so let's see. Okay, let's get started. So uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. My name is Li Pingchen, and I'm a postdoctoral scholar and teaching fellow in the East Asian Studies Center at the University of Southern California. I hope you guys are all taking good care and then staying safe. Um, so uh, welcome to the Sinophone Studies book series. This monthly series introduces recent publications about Sinophone studies, and our theme for fall 2021 is Oceanic Connection. Last month, we look at Jilong, a port city in Taiwan. Today, we will sail all the way to the Atlantic. And in November, we will encounter pirates, or I should say, encounter literature about pirates. You can find more information on our event page, and I will share the link in the chat box later. I wanted to thank Sonia and Grace for their great support for this series, and also the wonderful EASC staff for their help. Today, we are very delighted to have Professor Sean Mazagar here with us to talk about his new book, The Chinese Atlantic. Seascapes and the Theatricality of Globalization. This book is published by Indiana University Press in 2020. He is professor in the School of Theater, Film, and Television at UCLA. He is author of Chinese Looks, Fashion, Performance, Race, and also the co-editor of Octor Stages, Plays About Growing Up Gay, Embodying Asian American Sexualities, and also futures of Chinese cinema, technologies and temporalities in Chinese screen cultures. Our discussant today is Professor Lok Sui. She is Associate Professor in Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley. She is the author of Memories of a Future Home, Diasporic Citizenship of Chinese in Panama as well as the co-editor of Asian Diasporas, New Formations, New Conceptions, and also Gender Citizenships, Transnational Perspectives on Knowledge Production, Political Activism, and Culture. So uh, let me say a little bit about the structure of today's event. So uh, today's event will begin with author's presentation and continue with discussing comment. After that, um, we will move on to the Q&A section. At any point during the talk, feel free to submit your questions to the Q&A box. And if possible, please include information about your affiliation. The Q&A box is located in your Zoom control panel. There, you will also find the closed caption function. Please note that the live transcript is automatically generated by Zoom. So uh, that's all I have to say. And without further ado, Professor Mesiger. Thank you, Li Ping. And thank you to the staff of the Asian Studies Center at USC. I was a student at USC actually for my, the first part of my, my PhD and got a Welcome master's. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I especially wanna thank Locke for doing this today. She taught and then came here heroically, which I'm very appreciative of. It's always great to have the pleasure of speaking with her. And I just wanna say, unlike her, I was like, maybe I should take a nap before my talk. <laughs> so, so I had a much more restful uh, time. With. The way I thought I'd start was to give you an overview of the key words in the book and then take you through each chapter very briefly with an image that comes out of the book to sort of set up the stage of the analysis. And then we'll hear from Locke after, and then we'll take questions. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, give you a PowerPoint of today. So this is Myro, it's in Trinidad. It's where I spent some time with one of my informants, a Chinese artist, probably the most chi prominent Chinese artist from Trinidad, Willie Chen. I, inadvertently ended up spending a very long weekend with him and his family there, unexpectedly. <laughs> but it was, it was a good time for me to, to get to know him and his artistic production. And I just wanted to say that this, this 
book was a very serendipitous now in terms of my contacts. So a lot of the archive was informed by who I made connections with and the generosity of others. The Chinese Atlantic is a, trying to provoke a discussion about what I call Chinese inflected globalization. And I'll talk about what I mean by globalization in a little bit. The idea was to take different ways of thinking about globalization through different case studies that would both give us a difference in terms of content, that is a different way of thinking about the content of Chinese inflected globalization, but also help us think differently about the through form. So in other words, how do we see or perceive globalization through different artistic examples? The first thing I want to set up is the methodology. So the Chinese Atlantic's sort of major push is to argue for the seascape as a productive analytic. The seascape is a term that emerges, or it's an artistic genre that emerges coincident with Dutch imperialism in the 17th century, that is the Dutch golden age, when Flemish and Dutch men were going to sea in mass numbers and therefore changing how they were perceiving the world quite literally. And so you get an artistic genre that captures that moment or that change in how we see. So in that regard, I think of the seascape as the watery equivalent of a landscape in terms of its generic properties. So it's ideological. For me, it's also an epistemological frame. That is, it's just how we know something or the limits of what we can know. So the seascape obviously captures a moment of the sea and freezes it. But the sea, of course, is ever changing and dynamic. So in that way, it works in ways that later technologies would, would make more render more complicated. So film obviously can move with, this, with the churning of the sea and the seascape traditionally does not. The seascapes of interest to me are also events insofar as the seascapes involve action, either in the visual representation itself or in the process of spectatorship. So I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit more because it's that in this regard that I mean the term theatricality. So I'll explicate that a bit more in just a couple of minutes. Suffice it to say that seascape for me is both a concept and a practice, thus theory and uh, practice, so methodology. The project initiated from a Mellon funded initiative called Framing the Global. Framing the Go Global gave Indiana University and Indiana, Indiana University Press a large sum of money to conduct a multi-year investigation that was supposed to culminate, or one of its research outcomes was a book series, which indeed they did produce, although not all of us finished. <laughs> but in it, it was supposed to be, I think, uh, I forget, it was five years initially, and it ended up extending to seven because we were all behind in our writing. But I want to talk a little bit about that because the group itself was made up primarily of ethnographers from different disciplines. So sociologists, anthropologists, et cetera. There's a few humanists in the group. And since we were spanning the globe, the 15 of us, two of us were focused specifically on Asia, or at least in my case, Asia and something else. So in the book, I talk about globalization in ways that are probably reminiscent to those who know this theory of Fred Jameson's idea of globalization. And I started this book when I was teaching at Duke. So he influenced my thinking around this time. So from the book, I say globalization might be defined as a material and affective interconnectedness often associated with an increase um, in speed and the dominance of a capitalist world order. So that's almost verbatim Jameson. And then I move on to say the processes of globalization are complicated and contradictory, which is one of the insights I really glean from working with the group in all of these different case studies that people were working on. So that interconnectedness, interconnectedness does not always yield interdependence. So that's an important point to me. And it suggests the kinds of range of experiences that we group under Chinese inflected globalization from people who are elites and have a capacity to move capital around to people who themselves are trafficked. I wanted to inflect this particular talk. I've done maybe 10 or 12 of these now in different iterations, but because Sinophone studies was the thematic of this, I wanted to speak directly to Sinophone studies, which I do a little bit in the book. So this is again from the book. And I'm thinking through Shishume's work in Sinophone studies particularly. And I borrow her definition as kind of communities that are contingent that emerge across national and ethnic lines 
based on Sinaitic language use. And for me, I guess my push is to think through the Sinophone, not primarily linguistically. So instead of doing, although I do agree with, with Sh in terms of thinking the relationship between roots and routes by questioning the conception of roots as ancestral rather than place-based. So I'm much more interested in the place-based notion of how identity formation works, how capital circulation works. So I want to register Chinese-ness as local by looking at cultural productions where language may not register explicitly at all. And this is partly my emphasis in terms of performance and performance study. So I'm interested in nonverbal performance primarily and theatricality rather than Chinese language in order to emphasize the visuality of ski seascapes and to suggest actually in line with some of Shimesha's earlier work, the visuality of the Sinophones. So the theatricality, I mean in two distinct ways. So the first way I, I intend this term is in the vein of Samuel Weber's work in this book called Theatricality as Medium. And basically he describes theatricality as a kind of condition or experience, the kind of thing that one might think about in analogy with people who inhabit a realistic stage. So people who are on stage in a realistic play, they don't know they're on stage and they don't know, they can't perceive the, the audience or any dynamics outside of the stage that might inform their experience. So in that kind of, using that kind of metaphor, he goes on to say, globalization names not so much an object as the conditions for all objectification, the conditions of cognition and action. It is a process by which the world of possibilities is at the same time totalized and restricted. So again, the, the world is completely contained and your place within it makes it very difficult to get a, a sense of the world as a whole. The image I selected here is not from the book, actually, but it's someone, uh, Professor Su knows it well, Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, whose work I came across later, and she's a Cuban Nigerian Chinese artist living in Tennessee. And I've been in dialogue with her work now for a little while since the book was published. But I like this image because it suggests a kind of totality and a kind of immersion where there's no real outside. She herself discovered she was Chinese later in life and then was asked in one of her invitations to do artwork for a triennial to think through what that meant. The next iteration of theatricality I use, sort of, <laughs> is Michael Fried. So Michael Fried is an art historian and he happens to be the art historian who has spent the most time elaborating theatricality, although he does it in ways that are kind of opposite of what I intend. Nevertheless, he has spent the most pages going over what theatricality might mean in relation to the spectator object relationship, that is spectator of an art object. He tends to be, to, to try to move away from that, the, the active spe spectator uh, and suggests that artists who do that are not as, compelling as those who do not. But nevertheless, I use a lot of his work in, in opposition to what he actually says, but because he just elaborated so much, what is it, what, how does the spectator, spectator relationship work? The image I have here is called El Mansojero or, or The Messenger. It's also from Campos Pons. And if you, I'm the editor of Theater Journal, so if you know, we did a recent issue on Minor Asias, and this was on the cover with a different background. She often performs this character named FIFA, who stands for Families Abroad in both Spanish and English. And I'm interested in the way that she creates an immersion into a kind of speculative geography. So I don't wanna say that much more about that right now, but I've been taken as my work has been received through the notion of speculative geographies and how they might be useful in thinking through globalization and other kinds of contemporary issues like climate change. So chapter, well, the introduction lays out the kind of key terms and chapter one then starts with the substantive analysis. And this first chapter is about what I call reeling. So I've divided the book into five basic logics or kind of structures that I use to understand or think through Chinese inflected globalization. This one deals with Caribbean documentary films that purport to show you what is real because they're documentary. And so reeling for me means reeling evidence together or winding it together. It also suggests the cinematic apparatus. And it also 
suggest the ways in which people react to stimuli. That is when you reel because something hits you or something, or you have a strong affective response to something. So I was interested in the way these documentaries did or did not move us in some way and what kinds of aesthetic devices they use to achieve those results. The images here are from Richard Fung's My Mother's Place and Peter Chin and Jeremy Mimna's Jamaican. So these are both Canadian Chinese artists who have been doing work that speaks to relationships to the, to the Caribbean. They also, all the films actually speak to some degree to family, family relations. So the idea is that kinship structures what Chineseness might mean. So one of the things that reeling does is it reels together these family histories to help the viewers and the artists figure out what does it mean to be Chinese Caribbean if we're going to use that term or Chinese Jamaican, Chinese Panamanian, et cetera. So I move from this notion of the real, because I, I was interested in how we understand the empirical, because a lot of the ethnographers in my group were, kept asking me, what is, your, what is your empirical? And as a humanist, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so it took me a long time to sort of think through both concretely, what is my methodology and what does the empirical mean to me, actually? And so one of the things that this chapter does is sort of set that up. In chapter two, I turn to a logic I call incorporating. Chapter two focuses on more abstract art in Trinidad specifically. So Trinidad is, I believe still, the third largest economy per capita in the Western hemisphere because it's surrounded both on the island itself and surrounding the island, it's, it, there are tons of oil fields. So gas has been a major industry there you know, and energy in general. China has started to invest in Trinidad partly because of, for, partly for that reason. Um, and you may know that even in World War II, one, sorry, I should, should probably have looked that up, but um, in one of the World Wars, uh, the, the uh, Trinidad provided the British with a lot of, of the oil to sustain their um, uh, um, machines. In any case, this one is called, this image you see here is by a Trinidadian artist, Afro-Trinidadian artist named Christopher Cozier, and it's called Gasmen. I was interested in it because it combines frontier imagery with this notion of the extractive or China as an extractive force. Um, and this actually takes place at a lake in the US, but I was the generalization of waterscapes to me translates well to a seascape in this case, and it works with some of his other images that I talk about in the, in the book. So the incorporating means literally the sort of incorporation of other materials into an artwork. Um, and it also means the, the incorporate. So I argue that Chineseness becomes a financial sign as opposed to having some sort of material body. So the, the or put otherwise, the Chinese bodies literally become incorporate or that is without body. So from this kind of notion of incorporating where Chinese figures literally become economic figures, I move to much more corporeal practices. And in that vein, I also start to do a different kind of methodology in my book. So it starts to shift towards what I would call more performance ethnography. So I move also from a former English colony turned independent nation state to Martinique, which is still an overseas department of France. And that has different dispensations for people who want to migrate there and then move on. So in Martinique, people establish residency, as Chinese migrants, for example, and then they move on to the metropole, which is considered France. Here, I'm looking at a Tai Chi master who was trained in France and China and then came back to Martinique to practice. And he's doing his, he's teaching a class actually in this photo that's right next to the ocean. So he basically with his class, he formed a kind of living seascape. And I was interested in Tai Chi because it has not, it doesn't really have a teleology. So unlike migration where you move from one place to another, Tai Chi doesn't get you anywhere. It just moves energy around. So in that vein, I was interested in calisthenics as they might or might not correspond to human migration. So from moving from one flow to another. One of the things that happened in, in Martinique is that a lot of the, so this is taking place in Fort de France, which is a capital, and a lot of the local Martiniquans, meaning non-Chinese Martinicans, closed shop for various reasons, and Chinese 
low wage workers came in and took over the shops. So it's causing a bit of tension on the island. And this practice of Tai Chi doesn't involve any Chinese bodies, although it involves all the other demographics of the island. So what was happening is that people who are participating in this were, were commenting on the Chinese workers in town, arguing that they were of a different class, that they didn't appreciate the great culture that China had to offer, that they were just interested in, in earning money. So those tensions I also explore in this chapter. Chapter four turns to a logic I call ebbing. And by ebbing, I again, I mean it in terms of form and content. So in terms of form, this was shown, I saw it both in South Africa, but also in New, York, New York's Museum of Modern Art, which is what you see here. It's a nine screen installation with images on both sides. So in order to see it, you literally have to turn your body um, and it runs for over an hour. And this is in the main atrium. So you walk, usually you walk through this space to get to other exhibits. So I was interested in the way that spectators did or did not take in this scene and they were literally immersed among the screens and how their attention ebbed. So that was the formal part of it. Then the content part was, the installation is based on a case of several Chinese cockle pickers working in Morakambe in England. And in that bay, the tide comes in around you. So they didn't know that that happened and they were working and the tide came in around and they realized they had been cut off from the land. And they, they knew they were going to drown. So during the interim period, while they were waiting for the water to, to crest, they called their loved ones back home because they had cell phones and they explained what was happening and said goodbye. So they had a kind of digital afterlife after they expired and their bodies were then revealed when the tide literally ebbed away. Then the, the phone call served as the kind of evidence of what had happened in this case. And that was used and kind of created a, a gave attention to Chinese human trafficking at that moment. And I was interested also in how that itself, that kind of case ebbs over time. So thinking about globalization through human trafficking and the kind of attention that's given to it or not given to it and what, is, and what it means to be the victim or subject in human trafficking discourse. So it's a, this chapter also turns, of course, then to ethics about visibility and agency. Chapter five moves to South Africa looking at mostly public installations, although this, although this one is an in, uh, interior installation, that most of them I'm interested in the way that they, the notion of the human transforms through these public art pieces. I decided to show you this one today because this is much more clear about what I mean by eddying. So this is a dance macabre, which is usually you know, a profession towards uh, a burial ground that's on a loop. So it literally is a current, it's like a continuous current that we that keeps um, circulating. And many of the, the figure at the front and the figure at the back, you see here, are literally turning on point or on point um, 360 degrees. So there's a kind, they themselves generate a kind of current. The impetus for this particular piece was William Kentridge's commissioned to do something in response to the Cultural Revolution. So he's quite taken with the red detachment of women. And you can see that the dancer, if you know that piece, one of the model operas, you know that the iconography here is very clear in terms of citation. So he combined that with a kind of African cosmology or South African cosmology from various local traditions. And that became the way he started to think through South African Chinese relationships at a moment when South Africa is uh, using China as a heavy investor. Uh, at one time, it was South Africa's largest investor. I don't know if that's still true. When I started the project, it was. But of course, I've worked on this project for so long that I may have changed by now. So I look at um, this notion of editing and the way that South Africa might shift our attention from the Atlantic to Indian Ocean commerce as well. Because one of the things that happened as I was working on this project over the many years is that Johannesburg started to offer flights directly from Johannesburg to Beijing to increase commercial ties between the two countries. So I look at that as a, as a way to sort of unthink some of the, the stuff that I suggest in the earlier chapters or to think differently about the earlier chapters in terms of what it might mean to consider the globalization, not just through Atlantic Pacific, but also adding in Indian Ocean trajectories. In the epilogue, I try to move Chinese Atlantic currents back to Shanghai, 
And I do that with Sai Guo Chang, who is best known as a pyrotechnician. And this is his LG explosion event. It's also, it, this is part of an installation called the Ninth Wave, which is also the flyer um, that I showed you. So the flyer shows the arc that was on this barge. And then as a pyrotechnician, he releases fireworks into the air. So here I was interested in thinking about the stakes of Chinese infected globalization in terms of climate change. So this produced, this uh, event produced a huge cloud of smoke that people in Shanghai worried was some sort of disaster that they had not been told about. Because the year before, the Huangpu River had turned blood red because there had been a, a porcine virus that affected quite a lot of livestock. And those animals were dumped into the river and just turned it red. So they were worried that another environmental catastrophe had happened. So this was, for me, a way to think about the stakes of doing a project on Chinese inflected globalization. Subsequently, some of my students and, and also some of my interlocutors in various places started to ask about well, what does it mean to think about globalization only through humans and animals? So I have a, a student named Clara Welch who's thinking about hyper object, objects like glaciers and questions of scale. And then on the other end, I have another student who's working, Elizabeth Schiffler, who's working on microbes and how they perform. So from the microscopic all the way to the glacial, it's, that's quite a range of scale. And they, they are asking questions about, well, how do these things work as actants in the world? What kinds of relationships or relationalities do they enable or produce? So I've come back to this chapter a bit in many of my talks to think through, well, what does it mean that I keep thinking about like these substances that are being released into the atmosphere or into rivers? And I think that's where the next iteration of this project is going to go in another article version. So I'm going to stop there um, and turn it over to Lok. Thanks. Thank you so much for that wonderful um discussion of your book. And I just want to say how um, honored I am to be here to engage with you um, on this project. And we've crossed paths many times. And this is yet another time, another opportunity for conversation. So as, as a way to enter into this discussion, I just thought I would um, frame it in terms of um, uh, providing sort of a larger, broader context, and um, then zoom in into the work um, that Sean uh, Metzger has done. Um, so I did my research, you know, in the late 1990s in Panama, um, during a time when Panama was preparing for the return of the canal from the U.S. canal, right, the U.S. Panama Canal back to um, Panama itself. And there was um, quite a bit of um, uh, processes put in place for that transfer, and one of which was the bidding war that occurred, you know, for um, who would be taking over the operations of the seaports on both ends of the Panama Canal. Now, in the 1990s, the late 1990s, it, it surprised everyone, including and perhaps especially the Americans, that a Chinese-owned corporation, the Hutchison Wampoa Corporate Group, would win that bid. Hutchison Wampoa, you know, it should be noted, is not a newcomer in, by any means, you know, to the seaport um, business. It operates seaports in Europe, um, Africa, the Middle East, um, Asia, the Americas, and it actually manages, you know, five of, of the seven of the busiest container ports in the world. Um, you know, the U.S. was so caught by surprise, you know, about this coming of Chinese investments into Latin America that it actually sent a delegation of people down to investigate whether, you know, it was a legitimate process or not. Um, and, you know, Latin America and Caribbean has always been conceived, of course, you know, as the America's backyard. From the time, of course, you know, of the Monroe Doctrine in um, the 1820s up to present. And so you can imagine, you know, what the U.S.'s response was when it really was all of a sudden, you know, the Chinese entering into their backyard, you know, into the, 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 um, the arena, the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. In many ways, what unfolded in Panama in the late 1990s was a prelude to what was to come um, to Latin America and the Caribbean in the 2000s. It marked the dramatic entry of Chinese inflected globalization. You know, this is um, something that uh, is a key theme, you know, of course, the, 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 in fact, the main object of study for Sean um, Metzger's work. And it was indeed very theatrical as well. 
The unexpected arrival of big Chinese finance sparked national discussion. The media covered stories of the history of Chinese migrants, current Chinese waves of undocu um, undocumented Chinese, um, diplomatic visits, promises of trade and economic investments sealed by dramatic scenes of vigorous diplomatic handshaking, and of course the black back and forth movements, you know, of um, diplomats, you know, between China and Panama. This this kind of um, story or narrative repeats itself, you know, in different parts of Latin America for you know since really the the 1990s onward. The incorporation of this new Chinese investment into Panama required tremendous cultural work as well. Long history of Chinese migration, the integration was rehearsed, the narrative of the long migration um, of the Chinese to Panama was rehearsed tirelessly and became the lore that both represented a synergized Chinese Panamanian past and that justified the anticipated Chinese Panamanian future. Indeed, alongside the arrival of Chinese capital also came an outpour of Chinese cultural um, productions and celebrations that display the multifarious contributions of the Chinese. Such and these included, you know, Chinese folk dance, the Kung Fu lessons, Chinese food, the acupuncture, the Chinese herbal medicine. So all of these were kind of the, the cultural forms through which Chineseness was being um, performed um, imagined and integrated into this landscape. Um, the, the cultural forms, along with the more recent arrival of um, uh, the Confucius Institute, you know, throughout this region, are what political scientists call soft power. That is um, being exercised by the Chinese state to affect um, their influence um, into this region, as opposed to, of course, the hard power of military imposition. And then late 1990s, the Fata Morgana of what, what is to come, um, what Sean Metzger calls the Chinese inflected globalization was hardly discernible from the vantage point of the shores of Latin America and the Caribbean. But by the 2000s, it was made fully evident that Chinese political and economic investments in this region was no passing flame. The timely publication then of the Chinese Atlantic illuminates the vista of Chinese inflected globalization, whose hues, contours, and shadows have been deepening since the turn of the 21st century. The contributions of his book are many, um, but let me just focus on a few um, within the limited time that I'm given, and I want to be able to also um, converse with him as well on his book. Um, the most provocative, I think, aspect of the book is the naming of the Chinese Atlantic. Um, it is, you know, obviously the most um, uh, dramatic and, and important one to address here. The Chinese traumatic um, Atlantic both plays with and disrupts the more established oceanic um, metaphors like the Black Atlantic and the Asia Pacific, both of which conjure particular kinds of racialized space. In juxtaposing Chinese and Atlantic, the book performs several critical moves at once. First, um, so the book focuses on the contemporary moment of this um, Chinese inflected globalization. It reinserts the long historical presence of Chinese migration to the Caribbean and their deep social and cultural entrenchment in the making of this region. And here I'm referring to Chinese labor, that occurred in um, the mid 19th century and the subsequent social, political uh, and cultural um, integration into this region. Second, it takes seriously the emergent cultural forms and practices that illuminate the mixed desires, fantasies and anxieties of Chinese economic influence in this region. Here, um, Sean Metzger draws on the concept of, of theatricality to show the constructedness of these cultural forms and practices that clearly put understandings of Chineseness on display, whether it is through documentary films, art exhibitions, or Tai Chi classes. Chineseness is being performed and actively molded across these multiple genres of theatricality. Third, the book illustrates um, the multiple perspectives of Chinese inflected globalization from different vantage points, both in terms of geography and in subject position. Geographically, Metzger engages with, uh, with mainly the Caribbean, but also 
the US and Canada, as well as England and South Africa. In terms of subject position, he guides us through the works of Chinese descended Caribbean filmmakers and artists, um, as well as um, Carib non-Chinese Caribbean, um, you know, uh, Tai Chi practitioners and whatnot, as well as artists that are based in um, England and South Africa. It also points to the range of issues, um, practices and concerns that come to produce the Chinese Atlantic. He raises questions about how Chinese descendant Caribbean makes sense of their Chinese ethnicity at this historical juncture when Chinese economic success is celebrated. And, and he asked the question of how non-Chinese Caribbeans come to engage and understand Chineseness as sources both um, to be embraced as well as to be um, rejected and shunned. How the trafficking of Chinese migrant labor remains a haunting underside of capitalist um, accumulation. Um, I also appreciate Metzger's proposal of the seascape as both a conceptual metaphor and methodology to study Chinese inflected globalization in the making of the Chinese Atlantic. In the context of the Caribbean, the use of seascape is particularly apt. The islands are surrounded by, wa by water, connected with its, through its currents and constituted by global flows of people, goods, ideas, and finances. Seascape, he suggests, isolates particular places, insists on incompleteness of any given vision, flows beyond the boundaries of a given border, and offers an apparent surface floating on top of a deep history. In these ways, seascapes captures a sense of expansiveness. It is dynamic, ever-changing, fluid, and decentered. As a heuristic, seascapes demonstrates um, the interconnectedness of oceanic zones as physical um, waterways and as paradigms of knowledge. And this is a quote that I take from him. Um, I have a couple of questions um, you know, to uh, ask. Um, Sean about, you know, that that was raised, I think, in his book through the question of seascapes and the, the um, Chinese Atlantic. Um, one, the first one I have is really around the, the, um, the building off of and the riffing, you know, uh, from the Black Atlantic. Um, in Gilroy's Black Atlantic, he's really talking about the construction um, of this shared consciousness and shared um, history and repertoire, you know, that um, that is constructed through the circulation of global um, uh, productions, you know, um, all along the edges, you know, of the of the Atlantic, um, whether it is in England, in the US or the Caribbean. And I'm wondering, I, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the attentiveness, you know, to the ways in which you engage the local specificities and how it's grappling with the Chinese inflected globalization. But I'm wondering also to what extent is there, um, in your view, sort of an emergence of this shared um, consciousness or a shared um, um, uh, you know, set of texts or cultural productions that come to be understood among everyone, you know, as, as um, a Chinese Atlantic um, uh, cultural production um, or, or uh, you know, consciousness and what have you. Um, the other question I have is, um, I love the notion of oriental sensitivity that you propose in your chapter of flowing. And it's, it's particularly interesting because it, um, it really calls attention to the myriad ways in which Chineseness is being understood, um, incorporated, and at times rejected as well, right? Oriental sensitivity, um, you use it as an interpretive tool um, that allows you to attune to the different ways in which Chineseness is rendered um, by Chinese and non-Chinese alike. This is raised, um, for me, the question of uh, how the embodiment of Chineseness by non-Chinese through the practice of Tai, tai Chi um, is articulating a kind of Orientalist um, imaginary. Um, you also bring up at, in that chapter around uh, a comedian's jokes, you know, of recent Chinese migrants. And it's evident, at least in that chapter, that um, while there is 
a way in which uh, the non-Chinese Caribbean is highlighting certain high culture, you know, of Chineseness, that they try to incorporate that aspect, but at the same time that there's a, a real rejection of Chinese bodies and migrants that are on the ground circulating, um, you know, amongst them. So I'm wondering, you know, how um, one can reconcile these divergent processes that are happening, you know, at this critical moment of um, the Chinese inflected globalization. And um, if, you know, you see this, I mean, I, I, I think that it is recurring in many ways in different places, but how might you um, uh, consider that, you know, in, in sites like the Caribbean in South Africa and also in um, England? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and um, hopefully, you know, we'll engage other questions as well. Thank you for that. that. You're always so clear, which I've always appreciated about your analyses. And I, I think that you just, you helped me actually think through a question that was asked to me a couple of weeks ago at a different talk that also about the Black Atlantic. But I didn't. I think I answered. I didn't answer correctly because I didn't understand what was being asked. So this was very helpful. And uh, I, this is not to say that I have the answers, but I will try to respond as best I can because I love the provocations. So in terms of the first question, you know, I started this project as a kind of way, I mean, literally as a way for me to have a table when I was at a place at a table when I was at Duke, because at Duke, there was such a heavy emphasis on Black Atlantic cultural production and studies, but other ethnic or sort of racial formations just were invisibilized, you know? And so I was trying to think about how can I get in on some of these, like, just to have dialogues with colleagues. So it really started, I mean, my reading really started for that reason, because I felt like, I guess I have to learn what they're talking about to sort of, to sort of move myself into that conversation. And then I started to notice things that might emerge in, in those conversations if people had different knowledge bases or had different kind of empirical um, basis for what they were saying. And so I started to get interested in, well, the different presences of, literally the presences of Chinese people in these in longstanding Chinese communities in these, in various areas of the Atlantic that were, that would complicate notions of blackness, for example. So in that regard, I agree with you that black Atlantic writ large does have a, has a kind of, um, it has, it's a modality that performs with certain kinds of generalizations. And I might group those like, one is retrospection. So the, the sort of legacy of the slave trade looms very large in Black Atlantic studies, almost inescapably. So that is very difficult to talk about um, Black Atlantic cultural production that's not informed somehow by uh, chattel slavery. And this is also because people think of chattel slavery as the emergence or sort of the sort of emergence of global capital or sort of that kind of um, the sort of first case where we see like the kinds of elements that would produce globalization as we understand global capital circulations as we understand them today. It, may, it just made me think, well, what about other, other kinds of, of financial formations that have long existed? And of course, China has been doing that a lot. And Giovanni Arrighi's work has been useful for me in that regard because he thinks through like how do like overseas Chinese communities how do they create these kinds of overseas networks um and so I tried to think about that in relation to the Atlantic and and one one thing that became clear is oh if we tell if we start to add in these narratives then the notion of a kind of monolithic black Atlantic will start to collapse or at least start to there be there be holes in that idea so that was the initial impetus and i i do think that one of the things that blm has done for example is reactivate black atlantic sort of logics in terms if i can use that term <laughs> um, in terms of pain and suffering that are reinscribing earlier historical dynamics in a new vein but it doesn't really it it, it doesn't it makes it harder to shift attention to things like innovation, much easier to talk about things like resilience. So, you know, I, I've been thinking through this and in, in thinking through what China does in the Atlantic context, it seems that most of the discussions of Chineseness since the 90s and 2000s have been um, oriented towards the future. Like this is what we will become. And I find that I found that quite interesting, the, tempor the temporal differences between Black Atlantic and other Atlantic kinds of production. And it made me also think about 
indigeneity because ind indigenous peoples in the Caribbean are often were erased for a long time. And now there's a quite a resurgence um, in terms of thinking about indigenous populations in different islands. Um, so I've been thinking, and, and that complicates, of course, also the notion of the Black Atlantic. So, so what is the Black, the black labor um, replacing? So I think there's a lot, it, it made it uh, that, that kind of notion of uh, shared consciousness much more um, constructed than I initially had thought about it because I, I, I quite like Gilroy's work. I'm quite taken with it. And I think it, had, it was influential for a reason, but I, I felt that, oh, there's something else going on. And I, then I, when I started to look at different islands, like in Jamaica, I, there's a filmmaker I talk about, um, uh, Paula Williams Madison, I think you know as well. And you know, she, she has quite, she, quite a lot of capital in her family. So she was actually able to, sort of re-narrate her own family histo history, but also restructure like a, a huge kinship network. Um, I mean, that was, that had sort of fallen apart and she, she just, re she built it. And then in this kind of like very Confucian way, she built a kind of uh, like a structure for Chinese capitalism. That's a little bit different than I think the stuff that Ai Wang has, for, for example, talked about because she, it's really from the ground up and it's really a single person. I mean, it was her single, like uh, singular wealth that enabled these kinds of connections to happen. And then to facilitate people within that family to also advance in terms of um, class mobility, which I found quite interesting. But at the same time, she herself is narrating this kind of, this notion of a shared consciousness. Like it's a very Confucian oriented, like I am the daughter of this you know, Chinese man and I'm going to find him and then I'm gonna reconnect you. So it, it has this, it, to me that was very interesting because it, it does suggest this kind of like desire for something to create something shared. That's not, um, that is historical, but it's clearly being constructed in the present for a certain purpose. Um, and I think that as scholars, we have also started to do that a little bit. Like, you know, I've noticed that um, the, the, in the, I just saw on um, Sotheby's, I think, had the biggest sale for a Caribbean art piece, and it was Wilfredo Lam, who is getting a lot more attention as the kind of like, the progenitor of Chinese Caribbean art, whereas before he was kind of a minor surrealist, <laughs> you know, or like a surrealist who come to the Americas, but now is being um, seen in a very different way and then held up at, as a kind of, in, you know, as a pivot point or kind of a progenitor of other Chinese Caribbean art, art um, artists. And I think Richard Fung and I had this conversation about, about him in particular, because he said, well, I don't really think of myself as a Chinese Caribbean. I said, he said, I think of myself as a Chinese Trinidadian, but I don't think of myself in the, in, the, in the constellation of all the islands together like that. But he said, it's interesting that you do. <laughs> and I said, well, because we you know we, that was some of the, the um, we started to do Chinese Caribbean art exhibitions started to pop out. And you know, there's been there's been several, there's one in Germany right now that's happening. Uh, and I, I finding that kind of kind of interesting as, as well, that from these very disparate pieces, people are now assembling a kind of um, shared. Um, sentiment, and also perhaps then looking for like shared kinds of aesthetics and things that we would that might follow from that kind of um, collectivity. And I think that's a, I mean, a really interesting thing to probe more because my my suspicion is that you know Black Atlantic also does that, but there's so much more work in that field, um, and there's and it also has room for separate subfields within it. So, you know, there's, there's because of people, I think in Gilroy's work, the Caribbean doesn't really figure much at all. But of course people come back and, and kind of critique him for that. And then also explain how the Caribbean might, felt, how might help us rethink that paradigm in productive ways. Um, so I guess I would say that for me, there's a, it's an, what I've learned is that this is an emergent process and Chinese both destabilizes notions of like hegemonic notions of a, of a black Atlantic, if I can call it that. But also it, it is in itself invested in sort of creating a kind of, of some, some narrative, some coherent narrative, which I find interesting. And that partly has to do, of course, with Chinese capital, like how you attract Chinese capital. Um, one more story, then I'll move on to the next question. But in Trinidad, one of the things that happened, so Dai Ailian is that, you know, one of the most famous um, uh, dancers, it, it dance scholars and teachers in, in, in uh, China. And she was very important in bringing back folk dances and things, but she um, was trained in ballet and came from Trinidad. And, you know, when the first, when I first started going to Trinidad, you didn't really hear anything about Dai Ailian, but then, you know, within the, because again, this project was so long that, that, you know, as more investment 
came to the island. Some is a, a Dai Island Institute that was designed to bring people from Trinidad to China to sort of, and she had actually gone through England to, to China. But I find I found that quite interesting. So they're reactivating elements of history to sort of narrate a kind of coherence. I mean, like you had said this basically when you were giving your, your talk um, in response to me, you know, that, that people are re-narrating these past for a particular purpose to make um, uh, viable certain kinds of capitalist transactions, which I find um, interesting, uh, problematic and interesting. So in terms of the second question, um, the oriental sensitivity for me was really came out of a crisis moment because I was in in Martinique and I got really sick. And you know, I admire like also because she's a very, very strong ethnographer and I am not. <laughs> and, but I, and I had to learn as I was going as best I could. Um, and I got really ill when I was in Martinique and I got scared because I was like, oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, and I had to go to the hospital and there's like detail of the story in great detail in the book. Some people, I think this chapter people either hate it or they, they really like it because but it doesn't, it tends to split people, but it's very um, explicit about my body and stuff because I wanted to, because it made me realize, oh, like I am uh, both an object of, of uh, being observed as well as a subject observing people in these in these in these circumstances. Um, and my critique of globalization is fine to make, except when it counts, like you know, when you're when you think your body is going to like fall to pieces, or you're gonna have a major operation, or the doctor says, oh, it's very serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget he was like, I'm like, oh, so then you attach to like these global medical technologies that I very much appreciated at that time. I mean, very much appreciate. I was like, oh, thank God. I, you know, I can recognize what that, that thing is. So you can stick it into my body and I feel like that would be okay. So that, that also made me think through like, oh, so there's all of these neutral, I, I mean, these items that circulate globally that are culturally neutral. You know, they are, you know, they don't signify as imperialist necessarily because, and those things are often in like healthcare industry items. So now that's different because of the pandemic has made a, another figure for globalization, globalization has made it apparent that of course, medical technologies also are of course very um, culturally inscribed. But in, I think things like sonogram machines or, you know, those kinds of things like a, a hospital bed, those things have become quite standardized in the global marketplace, we often don't think about very much in terms of as you know, what is the, what are the ethics of globalization around those items? Um, so this made me think of this whole thing about oriental sensitivity um, and also like what I was doing in Martinique in the first place, because really I had been a fan of Fanon and I liked <laughs> the literature from Martinique. And then I, I found myself like learning quite a lot when I was there, but also everything I had sort of planned out as a researcher, I just, things didn't go right. And I was trying to figure out like, well, what, what do I do now? And why am I making certain kinds of assumptions at all in the first place? So after some debate with myself, I decided, oh, so this is going to mean that the, the method has to shift a bit, or at least I have to be explicit about what I'm doing, what I'm doing when I try to study globalization and the ways I'm implicated in that. Um, and I only could do so much in the book because I was still thinking through, you know, is, um, I mean, in a way, I don't think it's still like it sort of overflows from what it, you know, for example, overflows what, what it can actually, what it tries to contain. Um, and I did do another follow up essay um, on oriental sensitivity uh, to sort of work out more in relation to like, well, what does oriental sensitivity mean in relation to discourses of orientalism more broadly? Um, and in response to French orientalism in particular. So I've, I did do some, some, work in that regard. And I think there's a lot more room for me to explore this because the other thing that I realized in the book as I move forward is that I was interested in phenomenology to a degree, if, whether I called it that or not, as, you know, how do we perceive what we perceive? Um, and the sensitivity part made me think, oh, like, so we are sensing things like all the time, not just with our eyes and not just cognitively when we're processing things. We just, we're always in sensorial modality, especially when we're tourists, actually, or, you know, even a researcher as tourists, you're always present in like things that are new and, you know, like you feel things differently. So that made me think that the, that there's a lot of value in thinking through our own human sensitivities to certain sensations. And then that also reveals what we cannot know, you know, things that are 
either beyond our threshold or below our threshold of perception. And I think in globalization, there's a lot of that stuff that surrounds us, you know, in, in terms of radio waves and, you know, all, all these kinds of things or like nuclear um, isotopes, you know, all of these things that we don't consciously perceive, but are an index of globalization and the fact that certain kinds of global processes are happening. So for me, I think this is an area I'd still like to explore more because I feel like I just started to touch the surface, but it, it made it, um, it, it was generative for me. And I, you know, I, I had a long debate with myself, do you include like, so this chapter starts with discourses with Kristeva and Bart, you know, and people were like, why do you have these old European people in there, in here? And, and part of it was because I felt like my own expectations for certain things that I would find in Martinique came out of, and, and I would of Tai Chi too came out of certain kinds of literature I'd read and also certain kinds of you know global globally circulating texts be those films or theories that I just absorbed really without thinking about it that much but I, but I realized as I was trying to think through Tai Chi I'm like oh actually a lot of what I have in mind comes out of not out of a Chinese tradition which I had to learn for the book but out of a French one <laughs> so yeah thank you for those questions though that was really um, provocative for me. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks for that. Those elaborations. I just really appreciated um, your talking through, you know, some of these um, questions around the Black Atlantic and your your very important intervention. Because I agree, you know, the the Caribbean has been so hegemonically constructed, you know, as a particular Black space, and um, but Asians, um, have, as you noted, you know, has been there since quite a while, and yet, you know, their their presence. Um, and never gets registered, right? Um, and even I would say the the Indian presence, you know, in the Caribbean, which is much bigger, never gets registered, um, you know, from from a U.S. standpoint. So, I think that um, that disruption is so important and um, really appreciated. And I do love that chapter, by the way. I really, I, the, you know, the flowing chapter. I'm one of those that that you know, I mean, it, it just revealed so much, you know, in some ways. Um, it brought you into the scene, you know, it, brought, it kind of told us a little bit more about your, your research process, you know, you're kind of coming in contact with folks and, um, and I, and I, and I like the, the ways in which you grapple with that difficult issue, you know, of, you know, is this Orientalist, right? And, and, and I, I can, I can see the kind of, um, you know, what do you name it, right? Um, because it's not self-orientalization, you know, it's not um, when you're talking about sort of yourself, right, or um, or orientalism per se, but it's about um, the sensitivity of it that you bring, you know, as a method in some ways, as an interpretive tool um, for you to recognize these um, possible registers, you know, um, or, or, or the uh, particular places where it's being registered, right, like the, like the performance of Tai Chi. Um, and um, like the um, uh, the comedy show, you know, the comedy um, that you went to as well, that 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 kind of unsettled Orientalism, you know, around the migrants as well. Yeah, thanks. I just want to point out for those who are who people are on the call, you know, Luck has skills that I, you know, she speaks Chinese better than I do, French better than I do, Spanish. <laughs> so, it's, but I, you know, one of the one of my sort of queries about this kind of a research project when you when you try to discuss the global is then do you not do it because you don't have the, uh, the language skills are never good at, enough in my case or like, and I realize of course there's a quite, I mean, there's a lot of languages in this book that I, you know, kind of um, run into. And I, I do think that there, there's, um, I have great respect for people who, especially, I mean, literary people, of course, you know, you need to be at translation skill level. And, uh, you know, my, I, even though I studied like my French has been like for 12 years, but I still wouldn't put myself at that level, but it's still, I can communicate. And I, I, I'm very conscious of, you know, my grandparents who were um, um, working class Chinese migrants, they never were literate really in either language, in Chinese or in English. And I feel, and it, so I'm, I think about how they navigate the world and think through, try to think through like, oh, what, what does that mean? What kinds of, um, what is afforded by certain kinds of linguistic privilege or certain kinds of, um, of access to, to text? And what is, what do you miss from that? So I guess one of my things I was been thinking about 
that I'm just thinking now that I'm speaking to you again is, you know, like, oh, there's a, there's a way in which um, bodies register things often in ways that we find that we can't articulate necessarily in language clearly anyway. So I hope this book does some of that work and makes us less afraid to sort of at least try to partner with people to, you know, who, who are more expert in whatever field we are than we are. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, thank you, Professor um, Mester, and then also Professor Sui for this wonderful conversation. And also, especially, can I zoom in in some of the um, moments and also the keywords that is highlighted in the book. And so um, now uh, we will uh, be moving on to the Q&A section. We have some uh, questions from the audience. So uh, let's see. All right. So uh, we have one question from uh, Hiren, and then um, let me read the questions. Thanks for the presentation and discussion. This is Hiren from the University of Arizona. The Chinese Atlantic is a wonderful concept. I look forward to reading your book. Since your presentation mentioned and slash implied such issues such as um, hybrid object, the non-human, and also the inhuman, how do you think the Sinophone-based um, Chinese Atlantic framework accommodate these issues? Um, so it's the, it, when I said it's hyper-object, so it's Timothy Morton's idea of a hyper-object or something that's beyond human conception. Um, so the glaciers, because of their, their timeline for formation, but also their size, so you can't really grasp that. Um, I think because China, especially in Western discourse, it's, it's perceived in terms of scale. And usually in terms of a scale that is beyond the magnitude of anything we've experienced before. So it, there's all, this is why China is always threatening, right? Or like why a, a Chinese pandemic would be much more you know, disastrous than, uh, than like an American pandemic because China has so much, it's, it's so large in terms of scale. So I, for me, I think that one of the, one of the curiosities I have is how that kind of circulation works when something is produced locally in China, for example, and then it's the scale suddenly once it leaves its borders, it scales up very, very quickly in terms of, of um, Western reception, I'll say for, for now and possibly other places as well. So I think that's a useful, um, it's a useful as to think through that, that transformation because it keeps us attentive to how is scale shifting? What scale are we looking at at any given time? Um, and what's if I can say what's empirically happening and then what are we, what's the kind of discourse around it? And I think those two things are often in, in some opposition um, in relation to China. The non-human and inhuman, I would go back to, I mean, a lot of the examples in the last chapter are about artists who are figuring transformation. So in Tsai Guo Chang's work, it's like the, the, the only things left on the planet after are, are like these different animals that are cast off on these like Noah's Ark. So for me, and that makes me also think of like other kinds of non-humans that China has used for soft power purposes, like the panda. Because, you know, panda power is a real thing and has like actually, there's like a lot of financial transactions that happen if you, if you happen to run a zoo and loan out a panda from China. And it's also a very interesting case study of biopolitical management because China, if that panda burrs a, a cub, China still owns that cub. Um, so I find that, you know, if we extrapolate that to like, human management or just you know biopolitics more generally i think there's a lot of a lot of um value in thinking through well how are non-human um, actants being managed by different kinds of governance structures and if we if we can attune to that to some degree we'll figure out a lot more about how humans work you know and where humans can innovate and where things when things solutions we, that we try to to render in public in the public when they fail why are they failing um, so I guess that's how I would answer that question. Right, thank you. And then um, let's see. Um, so we have uh, another question um, from uh, Jenny Rogers. And then this question is specifically about, uh, I guess the processes of uh, you writing this book and then also your interlocutor. So let me read the question. Can you share more about your interpersonal encounters and relationship with your informant throughout the project? For example, you mentioned spending the weekend with uh, Willie Chen's family. 
What was that like for you and how did that experience influence your research? In all full disclosure, one of my students asking question. <laughs> so, and I, but I also, you know, when I think about these, how one makes contacts, I kind of thought, you know, I read a lot of anthropology um, because I find it a very useful discipline to, to, for thinking through human interactions with larger systems. And uh, when I read someone like Locke's work, it seems easy like <laughs> you just make these connections and then they they like they they produce your their thesis for you and i was like oh so this shouldn't be so hard is what my initial thought was like it should be like people can do this so i should be able to do this but what i realized is like oh it's like there's a reason why people train for years to do this and why you know and how you develop a certain sensitivity to to your interlocutors in in spaces so i use the example of martinique when i first went there i thought well okay so i'm seeing these like Chinese characters on the side of, of buildings and um, little cats with their arms waving. And I thought, okay, so Chinese owners must be here. So I would go in and then I would interrupt their workday and start asking them questions about like, whatever, like, what do you think is happening in terms of, of or what, what is it, how long you've been here? What do you think it means that, that um, you're setting up shop here in relation to all the other businesses around you? And what is your relationship to China? <laughs> so all things that people would never, you know, I'm a complete stranger, first of all. <laughs> so, I mean, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was pretty bad. And I think people, I, I realized quickly, like, okay, so first of all, I need to have, develop more relationships with people in a, in, on their own timeline and whatever that timeline means. So that meant that it took me much longer than I had given myself to do research. And, and then the research became, you know, not just, you know, like a couple of weeks and then I could be going back year after year after year to try to, to make connections and make my presence feel like, oh, this person actually has some investment. And to shorthand some of these conversations, I found the easiest way to like start a conversation was like, oh, I have like relatives in the Caribbean who are also Chinese, you know, and that would start like a kind of easy way into a conversation. Um, so that was an interesting process for me. I mean, Willie was very invested in me meeting his entire family. So he wanted me to like meet all his brothers and it, like he whisked me away. I actually had gone to Trinidad and I had, um, my luggage hadn't arrived. So I only had like flip flops, shorts and a tank top. And I had to go to this meeting like the next day so nothing was open so i had to like go in that outfit to this what was supposed to be a relatively formal meeting and i walk into this chinese restaurant and he's brought his entire family at this gigantic banquet table and i come in as the guest <laughs> i was like i'm so sorry um but he you know and i thought i was going to look at i wanted initially i thought i was very early i wanted to look at his plays and his um literary materials because I knew I would read some of them before and he had no interest in showing me that so I, I mean he ended up sort of shaping what I would see so he took me around um, his hometown of San Fernando and showed me like oh I built I, I constructed this um, sculpture here and I want to talk to you about it and then he wanted to show me his art pieces so that really shifted the way I thought about what I would be looking at and it also meant that I had to accommodate in terms of my analyses like things that I may not know very much about. So I, I ended up learning a lot about Trinidadian art history for that reason. Um, and I remember speaking to Chris Cozier one time just to finish the story. And he, uh, we were in the car and he asked me a question. Uh, I think about how I would situate Willie Chen in relation to other artists on the island. And I found myself like, this sort of out of body experience because this person in the car narrating like this history of all of these art Chinese artists on the island it's sequentially in relation to the art movements in the island and I was like who is that <laughs> like oh it's me <laughs> it's like, but I had spent so much time and you know kind of time to process it and then at that point I felt like well I guess I know this well enough now like it feels like I sort of absorbed it enough but it was an interesting insight for me because I really I felt most of the time like an outsider and so it took me a long time to make to for me to feel like I know enough about the situation I'm looking at to write something um, about it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds like a wonderful adventure for uh, research, but also for, you know, knowing more uh, kind of like context for the work and then also the, uh, the uh, situation around the uh, artwork that uh, you will be analyzing for the book as well. So uh, thank you for that. And we have a uh, next question. Um, so let me read the question. 
So um, I'm especially interested, uh, this question is from An Ru Zhu. Um, this is, I am especially interested in your emphasis on the nonverbal performances. This approach provides a different way, different from a text-based approach, a different way to ana analyze the interconnectedness of framing the global, including networks, relationships between the creator and the various places. Would you mind uh, talking a little bit more about uh, this uh, nonverbal performances? Yeah, I think, so I, I talk, a, I think a lot about methods now in the book as such, but before I just thought of, I thought of more about like discourse. So like how, how do I create a discourse that matches my object of study? So if you know my first book, it has a lot of um, sewing metaphors and a lot of like, and it's about fashion in terms of, there's a lot of, um, seamless and stitching and that kind of fabrics, you know, woven together um, in, and I was very conscious of trying to do that. And in this book, I really wanted to create a kind of nautical discourse, but I don't have much experience on the sea as such. So I started to go on sailing trips quite a lot. And um, the, because I wanted to see how sailors actually talk about the water when they're on the water. So I spent a lot of time on, on boats um, and looking at the water also to see like, okay, so what, like trying to figure out like, how does your vision change when you're at sea? Like what, what happens? So I did a lot of, of week long boat trips actually that would um, take me in different places and I would pay attention to the waves, the light as it hits the water, um, the horizon, when you can see the horizon, when you can't see the horizon. And then I tried to, and then I went, I, in addition to that, I went to a lot of maritime museums, which I never had done in my life. And I started to look at like things like sextants and octants, you know, like those kinds of things used for navigational tools. Um, because I was trying to figure out like, well, how do these things, how do, what is the daily life? How does the continu continuing experience of being at sea produce a certain kind of discourse? And because a discourse then to me reveals a certain awareness of how the sea shapes our perception. So, that was all not, I mean, most of that was nonverbal for me because it involved like, you know, people could explain to me, you know, like, oh, this is where I'm navigating this way. <laughs> but until you actually try to do it, it's very difficult to, to sort of get that in your body, right? And people, I mean, they, their survival depends on them being able to navigate these things um, and to know like what to look for in, in different kinds of currents or to look out for certain kinds of eddies or, or that kind of thing. So I suppose, Part of my emphasis, uh, once I turned to the seascape as an analytic, I realized, oh, you could, I could do it just as a formal thing in terms of paintings. But those paintings also ostensibly reflect a different kind of life experience. And I wanted to try to capture that. And that life experience was a kind of performance that just happened to be frozen in time. You know, and it is a painterly performance, for example, or in some cases, a theatrical one or a photographic one. But they are gesturing or, or indexing some, some other kind of phenomena that I felt I didn't have a, a strong grasp of. And I really wanted to spend time to try to understand as best I could um, what that meant. So also time passes differently, right? Because if, if you're sailing on a boat, you could see that island, but it's going to take a long time to get there because you might have to tack depending on the wind and things like that. So it made me much more conscious of how how we move. And also, what, is it, what does it then it mean to move things like trade? So when we were using actual seaways to move things, what kind of timeline are people thinking about um, versus when we think about the jet age, you know, when it came in, what does that, what does that enable? Um, and then when we move into the age of information, you know, where things move much faster, but also are reliant on certain kinds of uh, structures like undersea cables for the internet. Like, what are we seeing and not seeing? So I think for me, the kinds of both human and non-human performances made me think differently about how flow, different kinds of global flows work. Like what is literally the technology that facilitates something moving from one place to another, assuming that globalization is on some level, um, uh, a kind of um, some sort of movement from something or, or some kind of, of, of mass movements happening at the same time. 
All right, awesome. Thank you for that. And um, so our audience, uh, feel free to uh, submit your questions. But now I guess I have the privilege to ask my questions and um, sort of uh, um, um, uh, continue the conversation. So my question is, um, it's actually about this, uh, also about like Chinese Atlantic and especially about the term Chinese. And then as uh, your analysis and also um, the different uh, um, exploration that the Chinese-ness quote unquote is actually contested. And that in a way that is also, uh, as you mentioned, like place-based, how that is being practiced and how that is being uh, performed as well uh, for place-based, but also for uh, individual uh, practice as well. So I was wondering that, uh, so in this kind of concept of Chinese Atlantic, so how do we understand or approach or even sort of reimagine the Chinese in the Chinese Atlantic? So especially in the different temporal dimension as well. Uh, for example, the uh, Chinese migration in different, in the, uh, late 19th century and nowadays it will be really different uh, formulation of what the Chinese must mean. So I was wondering whether you can talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, you know, I feel within the US context, Asian American studies has been good about tracking different currents of Chinese, such as, at least Poissonese, you know, and, and then later immigrants post 1965. So, and my family is, you know, is, they, they were Toysonese speakers. Um, or Toy Song speakers, you know, so I, um, I feel like moving into a project like this one that I, I already felt Chinese-ness was disaggregated because when I went to university, um, you know, it was, it was like unquestioned that if I were going to take Chinese classes, it would be in Mandarin. And then I was going to learn a, cer a certain kind of, um, of because I, I was trained first in comparative literature at USC. And so, you know, the, the, the training wasn't, you know, it was like, um, you know, Chinese literature, you know, of great, you know, Chinese authors, regardless of where they live, but they were all writing in the same language, which is interesting because China has so many languages. Um, and I suppose in the Caribbean, one of the things that, that I found interesting was people like in the U.S., but there's just the communities are a bit smaller. So you see, you know, you see enclaves of people who speak certain or have certain family languages, but depending on the migration patterns, they may or may not have a lot of other speakers of that, you know, of the dialect it, it, near them or around them. Um, and like in, in Willie Chen's case, his family actually split. So half of them ended up in Trinidad and half of them ended up in Jamaica. And then they ended up forming different kinds of communities. Um, and so they they adapted to who, whoever was was there, and and like in the U.S., you know, they had um, family associations and stuff helped um, create certain kinds of continuities. But those continuities were broken when new migrant workers were were brought, you know, to work on um, projects in the two thousands. Um, and there were quite a few of them relative to the size of the Chinese um, population. And it, it introduced a kind of new dynamic, at least in in Trinidad specifically, because um, there were enough migrant workers to come. The two big board, um, uh, performing arts centers were built by Chinese loans and labor um, in Trinidad. And when that happened, the community expanded quite a lot. And people had were, were concerned about who are all these migrant laborers that are here, are these guest workers who are here? And they were not treated particularly well. They did not speak English. Um, so they couldn't assimilate well. And um, some people on the island decided to, you know, have a bilingual newspaper for folks and, you know, to create services. But that created a lot of, of conflict. But it also made people who were on the island re-narrate their histories in a way in relation to these new migrants, because they were trying to say, like, well, I'm not like that. Meaning, you know, like, it's, and usually in terms of class, right? Like, I have, you know, I'm now middle class or upper middle class, or, um, and these people are working class laborers who have been sent over. And I, f I found that kind of narrative repeating in many places I went. Like, there was kind, there was strong class distinctions that sometimes broke down in terms of language, also, or ability to use certain languages. So in Martinique. Um, you know, I'd approach people first in French, and then I would switch to Mandarin. But if, if something else came back, I, I was like, oh, I don't think we're going to be able to communicate. <laughs> and, so, and that was actually quite interesting to me, um, because I thought, 
I, I, because because I came with assumptions right away that I had not interrogated, which I should have interrogated. But it was people, you know, coming from all over, and they had just ended up here, and they might speak Mandarin or they might not, and they usually didn't speak French well. Um, some of, and if they were learning something, it was often Creole because Creole was used in daily life, you know, more. And I had real trouble with like getting my head around Creole. So, so, it, and it, so that became an interesting problem for me. It's like, well, how do we, how do we have conversations? Um, and, it, and part of that meant that I ended up talking to more elites than I did people on the ground. So, so like the head of the Chinese association in Martinique, you know, speaks French very well. So that was a very, that was a much easier conversation for me um, as to like, there's a kind of business folks that I met who are also, I mean, um, I guess one woman just like me. So we, you know, she, and she could go back and forth, but either, I mean, she was very fluent and she spoke some English too. So that was, I mean, it was like, oh, so this is how I have access to these communities. So in a way, what I learned was contingent on who to, I had access to. And I try to mark that some in the book, but I think that a pro any project on Chineseness is necessarily going to run into this kind of problem if you're dealing with, with like actual people um, and not just texts. Uh, and so I, th I still think that this is something for me to, to think through because it's also generationally, of course, different people speak different, you know, different things and they have different um, relationships to, to heritage languages. Um, but I, I, do think that the Sinophone, to come back to the topic of this thing, is a very useful model for, for as a kind of research paradigm, because it, it suggests that, oh, we need to know multiple um, languages or be conversant in multiple way, manners, whether that's language or in kinds of visual vocabularies or whatever, um, to actually understand one another and to, to try to create an analysis, which I think is um, a very good reminder for me. Awesome. So uh, let me double check time. All right. So uh, we are moving to the, I guess, the last few uh, minutes uh, for our uh, event today. And then so I will uh, now open up for uh, some thoughts or some final comments from Professor um, Messenger or also uh, Professor Sui as well. Anything you would like to share or um, any uh, final thoughts uh, you would like to uh, share with the audience? Can I ask Sean one more question? Yeah. Um, and, and that's in regards to, um, you know, Chinese uh, inflected globalization, right? I mean, we often associate that with the massive investments, the finances, you know, et cetera. But, you know, what's what I found interesting about the uh, Morakambe Bay, you know, is that this address of traf human trafficking of the Chinese, right? The laborers. And, um, and, you know, that doesn't really come up as much, you know, when we think of um, nowadays, I and mean, we thought we, we thought of that, you know, in terms of the 1800s uh, migrations and Chinese, you know, globalization, you know, or Chinese role in globalization in there, in that moment, but we seem to, um, you know, gloss over that bifurcation, you know, of folks that are, that, as you mentioned too, are coming, they're both going into these spaces, right? It's the, it's the projects, um, the investments, the finances, but they're also the, the labors that are actually brought to do, you know, these major um, uh, projects. So I'm just wondering when you're looking at the, the cultural productions, are you finding, you know, other, um, um, uh, you know, pieces that reflect, you know, that, that, that binary, you know, that dichotomy of um, Chinese um, globalization and capitalism, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think, I mean, one thing I learned doing this when I was looking at um, the human trafficking discourse, and one of the reasons I'm interested in it is because your human trafficking discourses recognize as subjects when you are the trafficked um, or when you're the person who exploits others. But it, otherwise, you don't register in the legal record. So actually, human traffic discourse has no investment in the life of someone who is trafficked, right? They're not interested in that kind of subjectivity. It's only when the point at the point they've been exploited, because then they matter in a legal um, sense. So part of that made me curious about people's lives, because one of the things that I learned in my research was that people, you know, that when we say human traffic, we often mean non-volitional um, movement. However, as like a, as one structure, but actually it's quite um, uh, perforated. So there are 
you know, moments in a trafficking, um, uh, or what we call a traffic cycle, where someone might opt in to be moved by someone, but at another at another uh, moment they might have no they might not have no choice. And so, it, um, I think I was reading some work on sex workers from China, and you know, some people knew that it would be possible that they might have to perform sex work as part of their getting to wherever their final destination. Um, and they opted into that initially, but then, you know, circumstances changed and some of their choices were circumscribed. So I found that useful as a kind of reminder when I talked to people because certain things were revealed and certain things weren't. So I asked, for example, I, when I was in Martinique, the, one of the, in the 1930s, this, this man named Mr. Ho came to the island and he set up a big company, which you can see from the highway. It's, you know, and it's called Oyen, which is um, you know, Ho's industry, right? So he um I was talking to the family and I asked, well, do you are you sponsoring people? You know, and they were very hesitant, but she said, Well, you know, the the fact is we can help people. You know, we have, because we have, they're running a large grocery conglomerate, we have quite a lot of, of money, you know, and, and we can help sustain people. So, so I, she just said, I'm not going to answer your question, but, you know, know that we are able to provide services for this community in different ways. And I thought that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, and I suspect that's true. You know, the other legal structures for migration differ in each of the places that I'm looking at. Um, and uh, I found um, by contrast, like in South Africa, the migration patterns, you know, was, South Africa was the, the one place where we had a, a lot of, um, of migrants from Taiwan, because when the apartheid government was um, in power, the UN recognized, uh, didn't recognize South Africa or Taiwan. And so there was a kind of uh, bilateral exchange there. Nowadays, um, there are more migrants coming in to, you know, Africa generally, and they, they are perceived as, as rapacious, so taking over, you know, jobs, but also as um, like incredibly either bold or stupid, so they're going on to like very dangerous borders, uh, you know, where there's active conflict going on, and setting up shops, and, you know, serving different people and making a living doing that, and I found that that was also interesting to me, so those narratives are not, they're not um, being told yet. But there are clearly there's some awareness that there's quite a lot of different kinds of populations here, and I think my first contacts in South Africa were actually people from the Hanban, right? So the the, um, the Confucius Institutes because I, they were so easy to locate, so, and I knew that they would have to have some kind of mission in relation to other Chinese populations. So that's how I started. So in each, you know, in different sites, I started by um, kind of whatever I could access first and seeing where that led me, but inevitably that also occluded certain kinds of populations. Um, does that answer the question some? Yeah. All right. So with that, um, I want to thank you again, uh, Professor Master, and especially in terms of like sharing your work with us and also for uh, having this conversation with us. And also thank you, Professor uh, Sui for uh, offering insightful comments and also for uh, be part of this inspiring conversation. And also a big thank you to our audience for joining us today from um, different time zones and also your questions that you share with us. So uh, I just share the link for our uh, event page. So check out our event page for other book talks in the series and also many other upcoming events hosted by EASC. So stay safe and see you in our next event. Take care. <laughs>